All right, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Tessa Campbell. I'm an enrolled Tulalip Tribal member, and I'm the senior curator here at the Hebo Cultural Center and Natural History Preserve. I've been with the center um, since 2009, prior to its grand opening to the public. Um, we always introduce our, our ancestors in our tradition. Um, I am the great granddaughter to Katrina and Ambrose Bagley, and the granddaughter to the late Catherine Campbell and William Campbell, and the daughter of Tulalip tribal member Walter Campbell and Catherine Campbell. In this evening's presentation, I will be discussing the history of the Tulalip Indian Boarding School. It is a painful subject to discuss, but it is a story that must be told. It is important to tell this story because many Americans are not aware of the American Indian boarding school experience. This is due to the history not being taught in public schools and isn't a topic of everyday discussion. As I stand here today and present on a history which both of my grandparents endured during the early 1900s, I can only imagine the ex what they experienced. Both of my grandparents were sent away to boarding schools against their family's will. Because the experience was so traumatic for Indian pe people, it was often too painful for them to discuss. It is told by my father that his parents never talked about their experiences at the schools that they both attended. My grandmother, Catherine Campbell, was taken out of the Tulalip Indian School as a teenager by her parents because all of her siblings had died at the school. Her parents feared that if she remained, they would lose her too. My grandfather, William Campbell, was a student at the Chamawa Indian Boarding School in Oregon. He finally ran away from the school because the superintendent would not let him leave even though he had already graduated. Here is an overview for today's presentation. I will first provide a brief history of the first boarding school in the United States and its purpose. Next, I will segue into the history of the Tulalip Indian School and life for the students there. I will then discuss how the boarding school has impacted our people and finally how we can heal from the trauma that our ancestors endured. During my presentation today, I will also be reading sections from Darlene Fitzpatrick book titled To Lay Up From the Heart, where Harriet Shelton Dover discusses her life growing up on the Tulalip Indian Reservation. She was also a student at the Tulalip Indian School in the early 1900s. In addition, we'll watch a short video clip where elders discuss their experience at the school. The United States government aspired to assimilate Native American children in the 1870s throughout much of the 20th century. The school's mission was to Americanize the youngsters while stripping them of their cultural identity and heritage. The first schools were mission schools run by Jesuit priests. These schools offered religious training to the students. The first government-run school opened in the 1870s in Pennsylvania, which was the Carlisle Indian Boarding School, which you can see an image on the slide. The school had the goal of immersing Native children into the dominant culture, which was the American culture. The founder of the school was Richard Pratt, a former Civil War veteran. The school grounds and buildings had formerly operated as barracks for the Civil War. While at the school, all aspects of a child's identity would be completely stripped from them. Their Indian names were replaced with American ones. They were no longer able to wear their traditional clothing. Their hair was cut, and they were no longer able to sing their traditional songs or speak their na native language ever again. The Carlisle School did everything in its capacity to kill the Indian and save the man. The building of a school was part of the agreement of the United States government and our ancestors 
during the signing of the Point Elliott Treaty in 1855. The Indians ceded all of their lands in exchange for the inherent right to continue to fish and hunt. In return, the government would supply a hospital and a school to our people. The first government-run school would not open until almost 50 years later at Tulalip. The Tulalip Indian School opened in 1901 and the location for the building and grounds was at Tulalip Bay. The school superintendent was Dr. Charles Buchanan. The first school building burned down a year later after opening in 1902 and a new one was built and began operation again in 1905. The school contained separate dormitories for boys and girls, and by the year 1907, there were a total of 200 children enrolled at the school. In 1915, a report from the Commissioner of Indian Affairs states that the aim and purpose of the school was to prepare students for life in general, prepare students for a definite domestic or industrial place in life, definite preparation for a definite industrial domestic place in a domestic environment. Sadly, the report states, quote, this course bends all of its efforts towards training Indian boys and girls for efficient and useful lives under the conditions which they must meet after leaving school. The aim is not to produce specialists or scientists but practical, efficient farmers, apprentice mechanics, who will develop into journeymen and master mechanics, and the future model housewives and mothers in the communities to which these respective students must return. Or in the early 1900s, going away to school for our people was not anywhere near a similar experience to what today's children experience when they go off to attend school. Many of the students did not have a choice in the matter of attendance, and they were simply forced to attend. It was obligatory that all Native children be placed in the schools, and this policy was enforced by the United States government. The government enticed parents to send their children to the schools, otherwise they would withhold rations, clothing, and other annuities from Indian parents or guardians who refused or neglect to send and keep their children a proper school age in school. In some extreme cases, parents who refused to send their children were ca held captive in prison. For some parents, it was an advantage to send their children to the school because they simply could not afford to raise them alone. I can only imagine the heartache of having to send your children away to an unknown and distant place. A passage by Brenda J. Child explains what many parents probably underwent when sending their children away. Quote, the experience was punctu punctuated by the trauma of separation of family and community, severe homesickness, and a difficult period of adjustment to an alien and culturally hostile environment. Judging by the many letters school officials received from concerned parents, the transition was no less and hoped that the promises of the many benefits their children would gain by a boarding school education would not only be, be fulfilled, but would be worthy of their sacrifice. There is no other comparison to what the, the children of the boarding schools experience, except the envision, envisioning of being abducted from your home as a child Imagine being taken to a faraway land to where the customs, language, people, and traditions are all unfamiliar. Imagine wondering when you would see your parents again or if ever again. Last, imagine not being able to speak your own language, something that is natural and something that you do every day. Imagine being punished just for being you and carrying on, the, carrying on all the teachings that you have been taught. Imagine receiving a hostile response to all of the behaviors you have become accustomed to. It is understandable how confusing the experience was for our young people. Harriet Shelton Dover states in the book, Tulalip From My Heart, 
Every time I think about it, it makes me mad. Being severely punished for something that you were taught to do at home. In order to fully assimilate the children, the school administration often eradicated any contact with relatives or friends back home. This means that the children stayed at the school all seven days of the week throughout the school year and were never allowed to go home on the weekends. According to our archival records here at Hebold, students were allowed to return home during the summer break, which began around August 1st and ended on October 1st. Students were only allowed to spend a total of two months every year with their parents. Often children were also not permitted to write or receive any letters from family members. It was standard practice that the students be kept in the schools year round and for as long as a decade, with neither visits to their homes nor visits from their families where possible. Even letters were sometimes withheld because of the lecherous influences such interactions might exert. Life at the school was very structured and extremely militant. The students marched to and from every location, and every student wore a military-style uniform, performed daily salutes and bugle calls, and performed daily military drills, which you can see an example of them doing a salute in the picture. So in this slide it is an example of the student's daily schedule. So prior to the arrival of the school, um, the students were accustomed to a very cyclical and seasonal schedule. Um, this new schedule would have been a shock to many of the students because it was linear, monotonous, and rigid. I'm going to read a passage from Harriet's book now. In school, we tried to follow what our grandparents said. When I arrived at the Indian boarding school in 1912, I was seven years old. It seemed so cold, and we are always running, running, hurry, hurry, hurry. Compared to my home, it was a traumatic shock. I don't think anyone stopped to think how hard it was for us Indian children to be taken to an Indian school and suddenly have to get up at 5.30 in the morning. At home, I woke up around 7 or 9 o'clock in the morning, and I could always eat. My mother would fix something. The boarding school was a dreadful monotony. Getting up early, and our shoes and stockings were left downstairs in the basement playrooms. We took off our shoes and stockings in the basement playrooms at night, and we marched up two stairways to go to bed. In case we tried to run away, we were separated from our shoes. I consider that like a life in penitentiary. If a bell rang, I ran. The discipline was to civilize us. So on the slide, you can, uh, it's kind of hard to see, so I'll go over the schedule. So the students uh, rose every morning at 5.30, and they had a half hour to prepare themselves, get themselves ready, and they had to have their beds made meticulously. Um, a lot of our elders talk about uh, how one of the matrons would go around and bounce a quarter off of the sheets, and if it didn't, didn't bounce, they were punished. And so by 6 o'clock on the dot, they had to be ready to do their morning exercises and the morning drill. And at 6.30, they had breakfast. And um, you can see all the bugle calls. There's different whistles, um, warning whistles, um, just all throughout the day. And then this slide um, is their weekend schedule. And there was no time for leisure time. Um, Saturdays was dedicated to more work. And then Sundays was dedicated to more work. And three Sundays of the month, they had mass. And at the very bottom, you can see all the different bells that rang at different times of the day. Many Native American students were exposed to a completely different learning experience and style at the boarding school. 
than what they were accustomed to. Prior to the arrival of the boarding schools, the teachings took place with elders of the community. The teachings were legends that were passed down from generation to generation. Our people's cultural learning styles involved observing, listening, watching demonstrations, or supervised practicing and participating. This new learning environment would have been a tremendous and dramatic shock to the new incoming children. Only half of the daily schedule was dedicated to curriculum, while the other half was dedicated to work or a learning trade. Another challenge faced by the students was that they had never been exposed to a written language. Historically, our people never had a written language. Therefore, they did not know how to read or write. It was completely foreign to them. All information was passed down orally and memorized. So this new curriculum learning experience they were exposed to, they studied, you can see on the left-hand side, was general exercises, English, arithmetic, geography, physiology, writing, drawing, history, and physical training. So their work for the rest of the day for girls included domestic duties, such as cooking, baking, sewing, and laundry. And the boys learned um, trades, such as farming, gardening, blacksmithing, um, harnessing, and leather work. So I'm going to discuss the change of the diet for the student. Our traditional diets consisted of foods that could be fished, hunted, or gathered. These foods were in abundance and our people traveled with the seasons to gather them. These foods included fish, shellfish, deer, elk, duck, roots, berries, and wild vegetables. While at the school, the students were trained to be farmers. This was not successful because the idea of farming was foreign to them when all of the traditional foods were available out in the environment and were available year-round with the seasons. The boarding school introduced a new diet to the students. These are foods that our people's digestive systems were not used to. These foods include dairy, wheat, caffeine, and refined sugars. These new food types were consumed daily. Sugary items such as syrup, ginger snaps, pie, pudding, donuts, or cocoa can be seen on this menu on the slide. Many of our people on our reservation day are lactose intolerant. You can see on the menu sample that the students ate mush and milk every day for breakfast. I'm going to read another short passage by Harriet Shelton Dover where she discusses uh, the mush, the morning mush. When I first got to Tulalip Indian School, breakfast was often oatmeal mush. I ate it because I was hungry. It was six o'clock in the morning, we were having breakfast. All of the smaller children ate it, but it wasn't much. It was in a bowl and it was probably about four tablespoons with about two tablespoons of milk on it and very little sugar but there were little white worms in it. I looked at it when I was small, but I was too hungry, so I just ate it up. Anyway, the matron went around to all of the tables and ordered everyone to eat it. If you didn't eat it, then you had to stay there. And if you stayed there, then you got a good licking, so you'd better eat it. And today, many of our people face many health issues, issues caused by poor diet. These include diabetes, obesity, cancer, and heart disease. The evolution of the poor diet can be attribute, attributed to the boarding school, the depression era, the reliance for food rations by government agents, and today with the advent of fast food. The uh, boarding school had a tremendous impact on the students. Um, they faced issues such as malnutrition, disease, and various types of abuses, such as physical, mental, sexual, and psychological. The health of the children was a big problem for the schools. Many children were malnourished or underfed. 
They were also exposed to disease and many types of illnesses. A number of factors contributed to the problem of disease in government schools for Indians. This included overcrowding and poor food. The school also provided irregular medical care. I'm going to read another passage by Harriet Shelton Dover in the Fitzgibbons book. Actually, we were almost starving. I'm quite sure people who hear me say that would say, oh now, you know when you're little you get hungry and think you are starving. But in that school, the food was never, ever enough. We ate roast beef and potatoes and it tasted really nice. We even ate roast beef and potatoes on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Sometimes the potatoes would last until January, February and the potatoes would be no more. So we just had meat and bread. Of course, there were never any vegetables and there was never enough milk. The pride of the Indian agent was the dairy herd. But the milk that those cows gave for over 200 children was never enough. I usually got maybe a fourth of a cup of milk. There was never any fruit. On Thanksgiving and Christmas, each one of us would get an apple. But once in a while, since the school had orchards, we would have one slice of apple pie on Sundays. I don't know what happened, but there would be years when we would have less to eat. So now next, disease was a, a major epidemic that afflicted the lives of the Tulalip community. Many of, you, many of our people died from disease, aside from poor nutrition and overcrowding. The major contributor was that our people never had been exposed to the, these diseases. They hadn't built up the immunity to fight them off. Sickness and disease caused the schools to be quarantined at times. There is a letter in our archives that sta stated if anyone tried or attempted to come near the school during an outbreak, the intruder would be put in jail. Diseases that ran rampart in the schools were measles, influenza, and tuberculosis. Malnutrition and overcrowding were factors that contributed to the outbreaks of disease. I'm going to read one last passage in Fitzgib uh, Fitzpatrick's book. Before the Roosevelt administration, if anything happened to Indians, you were a student in school, boarding school. They told you to stay home because the doctor at the agency could tell you were going to die. They sent boys and girls home, and the next year you wouldn't see them again. If they came from Lummi at Bellingham, Swinomish at LaConnor, we asked about different girls we were friendly with who had gone home. And the girls from there said she died. The boys and girls who went home didn't live more than two or three months. They were already dying in the school. Indian parents went to the agent to complain and said, our children are dying and we want them to have a doctor's care. Usually there was a doctor at any agency, but he refused to look at Indians. He took care of the white employees, the superintendent, an assistant superintendent, chief clerk, and other clerks. So a few of us from, um, a few of the staff members went to Hebulb Cultural Center a few weeks ago to do research to find out the number of students who had died at, while attending the school. This number is unknown. And we found some records between the years 1896 and 1925. And the majority of them had passed away from tuberculosis. Um, 52 deaths were recorded. And I know this number is not representative of the actual numbers because of a lack of information and the missing documents from certain years. Many children at this school experience different types of abuse, which includes physical, mental, emotional, sexual, and psychological. Aside from the loneliness they felt at the school, they also experienced a lack of love and affection. The students felt isolated in a strange environment. The school cut off communication between parent and children throughout the school year. This barrier caused the relationship between families 
to become dysfunctional and estranged. Some children may have felt that their parents no longer wanted them because they were never contacted. Next, the psychological and physical abuse was high at the schools. The, school, school, the student's identity was beaten out of them, which is what many of our elders depict. The students were punished if they were heard speaking their traditional language. This is the reason why many native languages were on the brink of extinction. Students were no longer able to sing their family songs or practice their traditions. Aside from practicing their traditions or speaking their language, students were strapped or punished. Sorry, for disorderly behavior. <clears throat> Not knowing the answer to a question and the worst punishment was if a student attempted to run away from school and was caught. Harry Sheldon Dover discusses in her book the punishment some of the runaways had received. She states that their heads were shaved, their clothes removed, and they were strapped continually all over their bodies. After the strapping, they were forced to wear girls' dresses around the school. So in this picture, um, Lita Sheldon, her librarian, had cropped out, um, zoomed in on a photo, and you can see this student here has a shaped head and appears to be a boy in a dress and he was forced to stand in the section of um, the girls for the photo shoot. <clears throat> Students also faced a major identity crisis due to trying to navigate two very distinct worlds simultaneously. First, there was the trauma of being separated by family and friends. In addition, the death rate was high on the reservation due to disease and illness. Many children witnessed the death of family and close friends. Cultural belief systems were lost along with ceremonial practices and traditional teachings. A big tragedy was the loss of the language. Many of our elders who have gone before us had learned the language and were fluent speakers. After the closing of the schools, those who were fluent refused to speak the language with close family members. Speaking the language brought back too many tragic memories of being strapped, isolated, beaten, or having their mouth washed out with lye or soap. So now I'm gonna play a DVD clip. In 1980, we began interviewing our seniors. The setting was a small studio, but it was the beginning of something special, recording the stories and memories of our people. I'm Cheryl Smith. I'm talking to Harriet Dover. Um, Harriet, you were born and raised on the reservation, weren't you? The Toledo Preservation? Yes, I was. And uh, that's a long time ago. These are our people telling their stories. This is a glimpse into their lives. For many, one of the earliest memories was of the Tulalip Indian School. We went to school half a day, and then we worked a half a day. Where did you work? I worked in a dairy, dairy farm. Were you allowed to speak the in Indian language at school? No. Why, was, why is that? I don't know, but they took your Indian language away from you. <laughs> you wasn't allowed to talk Indian. What would happen if you did? Oh, well, they'd punish you. <laughs> you know, she said, uh, oh, were you uh, talking Indian? I said, yes, ma'am. Who was talking Indian? I said, I was. <laughs> so, all right, right here. Well, anyway, we were strapped. Now, that strap was really something. Uh, years later, uh, we found out that that strap was, uh, that kind was also used in penitentiaries. So historic trauma is a result of cumulative 
of both emotional and psychological damage. This trauma is transgenerational, which means it is passed on from generation to generation. Historic trauma among communities results in substance abuse, suicide, depression, anger, low self-esteem, homelessness, and other destructive behaviors. <clears throat> Over the past couple of decades, there have been many efforts to revive our tribal culture and help our community heal from the trauma of the boarding school experience. Our tribe now has a Lashutsi language department that is teaching the language to our younger generations. Our cultural resources department makes efforts to preserve our history and carry on the teachings. The Cultural Center has held classes on how to reintroduce traditional foods to our people's diets. In addition, there are classes for basketry and weaving. There are many resources to help our people heal from the boarding school experience. On a national level, there is a National Native American Boarding School Healing Co Coalition, which was founded in 2012. The coalition aims to develop a national strategy that will bring public awareness to the history of the boarding school and provide healing to all afflicted by the trauma. At the local level, the Seattle Indian Health Board offers programming. On the Tulalip Reservation, parenting classes are offered to tribal members because many tribal members who went through the school said they had um, <clears throat> trouble parenting from what they had learned at the school. Last year, Matt Remley, Lakota and li liaison for the Marysville School District drafted Resolution 31621, which passed in December of 2015. This resolution will encourage the schools to include the history of the boarding school in their curriculums. The most important part of healing is to talk about the traumatic experience. This year on May 8th, Governor Jay Inslee signed a bill that makes it mandatory for Native American history to be taught in schools to acknowledge the history. This will help bring awareness to the history of Indian boarding schools and hopefully will evoke much dialogue so many discussions can take place and provide an opportunity for some of our people to feel more comfortable in sharing their pain. So this concludes my presentation. I would like to honor those who have gone before us and honor those who went through the boarding school. I especially want to thank Lena Jones in the back, our education curator for asking me to present on the boarding school as I learned a lot from my research. Although it is not the most cheerful subject to discuss, I want to encourage all of you to leave this room and discuss this history with others. I believe that bringing awareness to our country will be the first and biggest step for our people. We want this country to understand where we come from and understand how the boarding school has impacted us and has shaped our lives. So I want to also mention, if you wanted to uh, learn more about the boarding school, we do have a section in our main exhibit on the history. The Cultural Center has a traveling suitcase um, that is available to rent. It has 10 panels, and it was um, created by um, Carolyn Marr. She is the, she's an anthropologist and librarian at the Seattle um, Museum of History and Industry. And another important part of healing is forgiveness. We must forgive those who cause trauma and pain to our people. I would like to end my presentation by reading a passage from David Spencer's book, Lifted to the Edge, um, Reflections of a Tulalip Grandson. So the words I'm going to read are words um, that were told by my great-grandfather Ambrose Bagley to David Spencer Sr., my dear cousin. On my graduation night, June 8, 1956, a Friday, I had an unshakable lecture 
The best I can remember of what my grandpa Ambrose said is, now that you finish school, you still must keep learning to live and work in the white man's world. The way of life for the Indian is gone. We cannot live off the land and water anymore. The Indian cannot hunt, pick wild berries, clam dig, gather mussels, and fish on our ancient grounds. The white man has lock gates and signs to keep people out. There are no jobs on this reservation to support a family year round. You must look for work off this reservation and you must never forget where you come from. Always walk proud for, as an Indian. You have two different worlds to walk in. You must keep learning and learning. The white man cannot take away what you have learned and they cannot take away your Indian pride. And always remember that you are Indian and we Indians are survivors and carry yourself as a proud Indian. And Dave says, I've always carried these words in my heart and tried to live with Grandbo, Grandbo, sorry, Grandbo Ambrose's heedful teachings. Thank you. I invite you all to stay and have a snack. Lena provided with some food and Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.